Uh, thank you, Lisa, for that kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank um, the, the college and the Business Roundtable for having us here today. Uh, certainly, we're honored to be following on the governor's remarks. And, and before I get started, I wanted to share a little background about how we uh, came to be at this presentation this morning. Uh, but when, when Lisa and David and the team first reached out um, asking for our assistance in looking at Vermont's public pension system, uh, our first reaction was, of course, we'd like to help. And, and my second thought, and I think I expressed this pretty clearly, was um, just sharing the reaction that nobody thinks of Vermont as a problem child in this area. And, and I think at the moment we were speaking, we were finishing a report on the city of Detroit's pension system and completing uh, a reform in the state of Pennsylvania that saw an $80 billion swing in their uh, pension deficit in the course of a decade. These, these are places with really deep, intractable problems. Um, but as I said, I was happy to engage in the conversation and um, you know, went to that thinking of Vermont as a place that understands and knows how to proactively address policy issues. Um, and when we had the first discussion, because it's the world's most boring topic, uh, what we typically try to do is just wade into things step by step and talk about some of the basic ideas uh, that, we, that we see in the field, uh, what some of the key numbers are and some of the ideas that people are considering. And I found myself in the course of a conversation that I think ran an hour, consistently being challenged by everyone on the phone, um, clearly demonstrating they understood the issues that we were focusing on, asking really good questions. And I came to realize towards the end of it that we were being engaged in this process where Vermont knows how to proactively address policy issues. Um, and so we're really excited and honored to be part of that. Um, and, and as a, an extension of that, I don't know that we've ever seen a, a presentation by a governor that says, um, you can't manage what you can't measure, uh, which kind of gives us chills and makes us feel really good. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'm gonna try to jump into this. So in our presentation today, I'm going to give a brief introduction into the work that Pew does in the public sector retirement system space. And then we're going to walk through our research and analysis in three key areas, pension funding and fiscal health, uh, pension investments and benefit design. This is really where all the economics exist in this important topic. Uh, as we go through each of those uh, categories, we're going to spend some time talking about our 50 state research and some of the trends that we see, and then pause as we go to put Vermont into context as best that we can. Uh, in the course of the discussion, I would say that there's three themes that we're going to try to draw out. Uh, the first is our view that public sector retirement systems are as vulnerable as they have ever been to an economic downturn. Uh, eight years after the Great Recession, uh, fiscal solvency has largely stabilized for public pension systems, but we haven't seen a recovery or, or an improvement relative to where things were uh, before the Great Recession. Uh, the second point I would say is that Vermont's uh, challenges are, are fairly typical. Um, for the most part, the state ranks in the middle of the pack in all the measures that we look at, a slightly lower funded ratio, a slightly uh, lower rate of performance on investments, but uh, stronger inflows on the contribution side and some other factors that uh, put the state kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, and then the third issue is that we see some emerging trends and themes uh, around um, uh, stress test reporting as a way to carefully address and analyze many of the economic factors and issues that have already been discussed this morning. Um, and also some very innovative ways to think about public sector benefits in a manner that actually preserves a component of a defined benefit plan that can provide public workers with retirement security, but does a better job of managing uncertainty and risk on behalf of taxpayers. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust is a nonprofit philanthropic foundation. Uh, we have more than 40 active projects in the area of government performance, ranging from public pensions to public safety, immigration, elections, and transportation. Uh, we all, all the projects follow a very common data-driven approach. Um, we do 50 state and multi-city research on every issue related to public systems in our project. And then we also provide technical assistance to cities and states. That technical assistance is something that the project has been doing since 2011. And some of the recent and current engagements include Connecticut, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Virginia, and Milwaukee County. Um, in every single instance, with the exception of Milwaukee County, because that's a newer project, uh, we have been part of advancing what we think are very uh, innovative and forward-looking reforms. 
The way that we go about our work uh, re really takes two big ideas into account. The first is that there is no one-size-all-fits solution. Uh, we understand that in the state of Vermont, the solutions on public pensions and any other policy issue need to be Vermont solutions. At the same time, I think we also find that key principles can apply to how we think about and go about our work. Those principles we put into two broad categories, the first being around fiscal sustainability, uh, making sure that pension systems are affordable, sustainable, and secure, both for taxpayers and for public workers. And then secondly, retirement security principles to ensure that the benefits being provided uh, are meet workforce goals uh, to provide retirement security for valued public workers. Uh, th these are very high-level concepts, but I assure you that a lot of thought has gone into where we landed on each of these points. And in the course of any conversation, perhaps even later today, you, you will find that we will fall back on these principles. On the fiscal sustainability side, it all starts out with a commitment to fully funding the pension promises that have been made to public workers. We talk a lot about managing investment risk and cost uncertainty. Again, an issue I'm delighted has already been uh, brought up this morning. Um, sound governance practices are a way to provide information to ensure that you can uh, both manage and measure pension costs and liabilities. And the retirement security principles side really speaks to whether enough money is being set aside, whether the investments are being done in a professional manner that is um, pooled and low fee to nature, and whether they have a plan in place to uh, generate uh, retirement income uh, by converting assets to an annuity stream upon retirement. So as I said before, in each case, I think we can fall back and talk to these principles in the course of our conversation. I would also say, in, in, in honor of the no one-size-fits-all principle, we do have some pretty clear ideas on what we think policymakers in Vermont might consider. Uh, we've been careful not to, to overstep our bounds and put those on paper in this presentation. Um, but if anybody happened to ask me a question about what a five-point plan might be, uh, in the Q&A section, I'd be happy to lay that out. So the first area of research we're going to go into speaks to pension funding and fiscal health. Uh, before we get started, uh, a few common definitions um, when we talk about pension systems. The first two are actuarial measures that anybody who's been somewhat close to the uh, topic is probably familiar with. The first being the funded ratio. That's simply the comparison of assets to liabilities, the amount of money that's been set aside to pay for promised benefits as a percentage. The annual required contribution is a calculation that each state actuary does to ensure that uh, sufficient funds are being set aside to pay both for new benefits and to pay down any un unfunded liability. The financial metrics reflect uh, what we think is a more advanced way at looking at some of these issues. Um, it gets a little bit technical, and I'll try to build towards this as we go through the presentation. Net amortization to payroll, I think the shorthand for that is it's a better measure than the ARC to assess whether or not the state is putting aside enough money each year to pay for public pensions. Uh, our measure of this is very similar to what Moody's does, the rating agency, and what they refer to it as a treading water benchmark. And what it does is answer a very simple question. If plan assumptions are met, including the assumed rate of return in a given year, is the money being set aside through contribution policy in each state sufficient to prevent the unfunded liability from growing? I know that that's a mouthful, but I think it's just a way to think about are you, put, are you paying enough into the system each year? Operating cash flow to assets um, it is something that we've been looking at very closely and we'll be presenting on at conferences next week, uh, both in the Netherlands and at the Harvard Kennedy School as part of a bigger project on stress testing. Um, and, and it looks very simply at whether the cash flows uh, for particular states provide an indication of the risk of fiscal insolvency. Vermont definitely does not fit into this category, but we're finding that states like New Jersey, Kentucky, and Colorado have uh, genuine risks of having pension systems go insolvent. And in fact, in the state of Colorado, they, uh, the, the system did their own report and made public statements to say that if there's an economic downturn, this is a real risk. That's a big development in our field. Nobody has been talking about that with hard numbers to support it up until recently. Some of the headlines as it relates both to the 50 state perspective as well as Vermont, there's over a trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities based on how states and cities report their numbers for pensions. Uh, we also track the unfunded liabilities associated with retiree health care. Uh, recently put out a report at $645 billion is the latest figures. Um, as I said before, Vermont, Vermont ranks in the middle of pact on most of these metrics, a little bit lower on funding and investment performance, a little bit stronger on some of these measures of contribution adequacy. Um, and, and on the state's operating cash flow to assets ratio, which again we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, I think that uh, this is an indicator that Vermont is not one of those states, again, that is at risk of insolvency. 
But like everywhere else, I think attention is required. Um, we talk a little bit about, more about the retiree health care liability as well, and I'll put that into perspective shortly. This next slide shows the funding gap for 50 states based on the numbers as they are reported in each state's uh, CAFR, its annual financial report. It shows the difference between pension assets that have been set aside to pay for promised benefits and the size of those liabilities themselves. Uh, based on our last report in 2015, we saw a gap of about $1.1 trillion. By itself, I think this gives us a starting point to think about the issue, but it's somewhat limited. I think we need to answer the question, why do unfunded liabilities matter? Um, one point we would say is that over this same time frame, the amount that states have been paying into their systems has just about doubled. The ratio that we look at are the pension contributions as a percentage of state owned source revenue, figures that are produced annually by the federal government. Uh, by that ratio, in aggregate, states have gone from about 4 to 8 percent. So I think that's a clear indicator that costs have been rising. This next slide takes similar information with uh, two different changes to it. Uh, what it shows is the unfunded liability or pension debt as a percentage of U.S. gross domestic product. Uh, the differences are we also include municipalities uh, for this purposes of this calculation, which again is taken right from the federal government websites. Um, and we use GDP just as a point of reference to try to put the unfunded liability in the general context of the resources available to pay. Uh, speaking to some of the issues that you all are thinking about in forecasting future economic growth and revenue. And as we say here, and I think what's interesting is that um, the debt to GDP ratio uh, has spiked up as you might have expected at the time of the Great Recession. And although there's been some you know, back and forth with that, it's pretty much stayed at that level at about 8% above GDP. And if you step back a little further, I think what's also interesting is that the other biggest spike that occurred uh, happened around the time of the dot-com crash. And this is where um, coming out of the bull run in the stock market of the 1990s, where the S&P returned about 18% on average, and going into 2000 when state pension funds reported a 100% funded ratio on average, um, that big loss in the stock market uh, led to a deterioration in fiscal position. But even in the time frame where there was recovery before the Great Recession, you can see that the level of pension debt to GDP didn't improve. So we've seen two economic shocks where things have leveled out but haven't gone back to where things are better. And so I think this is the first indication from our perspective that states are as vulnerable as they ever have been from a pension perspective to an economic downturn. Uh, this next slide shows the picture for Vermont with the same information. Um, you know, what we see here is Vermont was one of the states that was very close to being fully funded for an extended period of time. And then coming out of the Great Recession, we see a picture that's very similar in a number of different jurisdictions. Um, things have stabilized, but for two reasons, lower investment returns, and Vermont has underperformed its peers in that regard. Um, and contributions that have been sufficient to tread water but not really pay down the debt um, you know, lead to the funding gap that we see today based on state reported data. This next slide just gets a little bit into the details of the funding policy that the state is currently following. Uh, the rules that are set in place to decide each year what the actuary recommends for contributions into the system. Um, I won't spend too much time on the details of this and if you look at the very bottom line I would say that uh, this is a very typical standard approach that uh, most states are following today um, which is a payment plan that has that targets a full funding day somewhere between 20 and 25 years. So Vermont is right in the middle of the pack in that regard, um, is certainly not one of the states that's being irresponsible on this front, um, and at the same time is not one of the states like North Carolina or Wisconsin, for example, that have aggressive funding policies that help to keep their systems fully funded. Just to put things a little bit into a regional context, we look here at the funded ratios uh, for New England plus New York. This is based on 2015 data as the states have reported them. In certain cases, we're about a year behind, and that's only because we are meticulous in going back and checking with every single state to verify the numbers that we produce in our reports. The 16 figures don't look very much different, um, and as you see, Vermont, again, is kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, the state of the New York has an absolutely rigid actuarial funding policy that has uh, maintained full funding for as long as our data goes back. Um, you may be familiar in Maine that they passed a constitutional amendment um, and Maine is actually one of two states along with West Virginia that have seen the greatest improvement in the fiscal health of their system since the year 2000. Um, Connecticut and Rhode Island uh, probably get the most attention as the New England states with the biggest challenges. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the innovative policies that Connecticut is trying to achieve. 
To broaden this out a little further, I think one of the points we want to draw out is that the fiscal health of pension systems across the 50 states varies dramatically. Um, and here again, we see Vermont kind of falling in the middle of the pack. Um, let's see if I can do this. Bear with me just a second. There it is. Okay. So since this is the world's most boring topic, I think we're going to try to uh, give people a cup of, cup of coffee here uh, in the form of some visual aids that we've looked at. I'm, I'm going to try to walk through this really carefully and then push a button and see whether the animation helps tell a story here. What this chart shows on the left-hand side is the funded ratio, the percentage of assets that have been set aside to pay for promised liabilities. Going from left to right, what we see is the percentage of the ARC payment, the annual required contribution that has been made. So across these two dimensions, we get information about how different states fare in terms of their fiscal position or their funded level, which goes from bottom to top, um, as well as their fiscal discipline, how good they are at following through on, the, on paying their bills based on what actuaries recommend. Um, we've selected 10 states here. We're starting with the year 2000 uh, to include New England, uh, along with New York. Um, I've added Pennsylvania and New Jersey, two states that have had really big challenges, um, and also included California as, as something of a benchmark for the, for the country in total. So we see as a starting point for 2000, most of the states were somewhat above full funding. Um, New Jersey is an interesting example because they were 110% funded as of the year 2000. Um, and this line right here shows that on average, the states were essentially full funded. Um, what's interesting about New Jersey and what this information is telling you already is that even, even at the year 2000, they were already getting in the habit of not paying their bills. We see that because even though their funded ratio was above 100%, um, the amount of money that they were paying relative to what was required was only about a third. Um, and, and Vermont, I think, as you can see right away, is, is on the right-hand side of the screen. I hope that folks can see this. Um, and really falls about in the middle in both regards. Pretty close to full funding at 2,000 and paying about 95% of its ARC payments. And then if we watch the timeline, we can just see how the different states have moved across the pack there. You see New Jersey falling. You see Pennsylvania racing to catch up with them in terms of having a negative fiscal position. Uh, California, again, falls right on this line of average funded ratios of a little bit above 70%, and Vermont is very close by. So I think the takeaway point is consistent with no one size fits all on solutions. There is no one size fits all story about where different states are or how they've gotten there. Uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey um, really went out of their way to ha uh, not pay their bills for more than a decade. Uh, in the case of Pennsylvania, they've taken very swift and drastic action and I think are back on the path to fiscal solvency. Uh, New Jersey is a different story and as we'll talk about in a moment is probably one of the two states we think is most at risk of fiscal insolvency. Thank you for, that's the first time that we've tried this in, in person, so thanks for staying with us. Okay, so the, the, this next chart shows one of the other financial measures that we talked about before, uh, net amortization, the treading water benchmark that we use to compare states as to whether they are following policies that can be expected to pay down unfunded liabilities over time. I'm gonna start by you know, pointing out the good news as it relates to Vermont to context and then spend maybe just another minute kind of walking through what this is actually telling us. Um, what all of the states with the green bar show on the right-hand side of the page is if they achieve their assumed rate of return in a given year and the other actuarial plan assumptions are essentially met or in line, they can expect to see a reduction in unfunded liabilities year over year. That's important because as unfunded liabilities shrink, the resources available to pay for other government core services increase. So in this regard, uh, Vermont is on the green side, which is good news. Um, and it suggests that if those assumptions are met, it will be able to pay down uh, the unfunded liability each year going forward. And then if, if, if we want to step back and, and talk a little bit about the plan design for the system, what we'll find is that the, the Vermont has a very traditional defined benefit pension plan, and I think that also factors into the thinking and how we look at things. This next slide talks a little bit about uh, op, uh, average cash flow. 
we look at benefits minus contributions as a percentage of assets. Again, I'm going to walk through this pretty slowly step by step and put Vermont into context and also call out some of the states that we see having the biggest challenges. So what the bars show is the funded ratio. It's the same calculation that we looked at before, just presented a little bit differently. And moving from left to right, we see South Dakota as the best funded plan, along with Wisconsin, uh, New York, and North Carolina. These are always the states that have done a good job of keeping their systems fully funded. And then trailing all the way down to the right-hand side of the page, we see uh, Kentucky and New Jersey on the right. What the red dots show is the measure of operating cash flow as a percentage of pension assets. Um, long story short, what this means is for, uh, if you look on the right-hand side of the page, that Kentucky and New Jersey have negative operating cash flows of above 6%. What that means is if they don't achieve rates of return on a consistent basis above 6 or 7%, their asset base is going to decline. It's not just a deterioration in their fiscal position, but they're literally going to be heading, heading towards a path uh, of insolvency. If you look at uh, downturn economic scenarios, such as what the federal government asked banks to examine in the Dodd-Frank situation, um, you see sharp declines in asset levels where states like New Jersey and Kentucky would enter into a death spiral. They would literally see assets depleting at a rapid rate uh, towards the path of insolvency. Um, Colorado is also on the right-hand side of the page. I mention this again because Colorado did a study to show that in the case of a recession, sol insolvency was a real risk and they're not even in the worst position. So this, again, is, is additional evidence that state public systems face um, the biggest challenges as perhaps they ever had. Vermont, I think there's generally some good news here, and, and I know that it's difficult to see, but if you, if you look at their, their cash flow ratio, it's negative 2%. It's better than most other states. And what that means, again, is that there's a sufficient amount of money going into the system that should pay down on funded liabilities over time and in addition, there's a sufficient amount of money going into the system that if we saw a recession, uh, I think this insolvency risk is not something that's a factor for Vermont. I know this is a lot of information. I'd be happy to come back to this later in our discussion. Can you put your finger on your point? I was yeah, I was going to. Sorry about that. Right here. Thank you. Does that help? So the funded ratio we've already talked about. Um, and then if you go to left to right, what that shows is it's still a negative operating level of negative operating cash flow. The amount of contributions going in is still less than the benefit payments going out, but the benchmark rate of return is only about 2% or a little bit less. Um, you know, essentially meaning that the state could choose to invest in risk-free bonds and still see an improved uh, asset level. So I think that's ge generally good news for Vermont. But at a national level, this is the, um, uh, th this is the most risk we have ever seen in these numbers if you go back uh, to 1997. This next chart is another national perspective in an attempt to look at the same issue in a slightly different way. What it shows is uh, the blue bar are the benefit payments that are going out for all state and local plans across the country. And the mustard colored bar shows the amount of contributions, the inflows that are coming into the system. Um, and, and what we see is that the benefit payments have been and continue to grow slightly faster than the contributions going in. That gap between the two things, that's the negative operating cash flow issue. And at the same time, asset levels um, measured as total assets to the benefit payments, um, it, it's uh, another indicator of insolvency, dropped off significantly as we saw in 2008 and have largely been kept flat. So this again is one more indicator to show that coming out of the Great Recession, as everybody knows, we, had a, we saw a significant deterioration in the fiscal health of public pension systems. Any measure we look at, things have stabilized, but they haven't improved or returned to pre-recession levels. If we go back to the dot-com downturn, we see that this is the second consecutive recession where things have stabilized but not returned to prior levels, and therefore we say there's more exposure than there ever has been. To shift gears a little bit, this next slide just looks at retiree health care benefits, or OPEB. Um, the measure we use here is the total retiree health care liability. That's the value in today's dollars of all the commitments that have been made to public workers to pay for retiree health care uh, when they're done working in public service. And we compare that total liability to each state's personal income. Um, I think this is consistent with the conversation this morning talking about the trajectory for Vermont's revenue and economic growth. Personal income is just an indicator of resources available to pay. Um, as you go from left to right, what we find interesting in this slide is that on the left-hand side of the page, 
there's about 25 states that have the highest ratio of retiree healthcare liabilities to personal income. The reason that they're all in blue is that those states all follow a pretty similar structure in terms of the benefits they deliver, which is a percentage, sometimes uh, usually approaching between 80 to 100 percent of healthcare uh, premium, healthcare premiums or supplemental benefits for uh, Medicare age retirees. Uh, we see Vermont right here is um, higher than most other states. The main reason they're higher is because they provide this uh, very significant benefit, uh, a percentage of premium contributions. Um, that becomes more expensive from the state's perspective uh, for two reasons. One is that the commitment to pay for full benefits by itself, as opposed to just giving a fixed dollar amount, which is what the states on the right-hand side do, or nothing at all, which is what some of those states do, um, is uh, more significant to begin with from a cost and benefit perspective. In addition to that, those benefits typically grow with healthcare cost inflation. So long story short, the states on the left-hand side of the page are offering retiree healthcare benefits that are exposed to the uncertainty of healthcare cost inflation, and so the liabilities for those states are greater and have grown faster over time. Are there any questions on this? I hope this gives a general sense of the retiree healthcare piece, which we can talk about later. The second topic from a research and analysis perspective, again, we'll give some national information and talk a little bit about Vermont as well, has to do with pension investments, and I thought there was a great introductory discussion um, discussing the fact that um, you know, interest rates are expected to be low for an extended period of time. National and global growth is, is expected to be lower than it ever was, and as a result, every forecast we have seen is bringing down the rate of return assumptions for public pensions. To provide a bigger picture and step back a little bit, the first thing we start with is just looking at what the trend has been, where pensions have moved out of safe investments like bonds and into stocks for a period of about 50 years now. Uh, over the past decade, the interesting development we have seen is a shift um, towards alternative investments, real estate, private equity, and hedge funds. And the percentage of investments invested in those categories has gone from less than 10% to more than 25%. So there's been a longer term trend towards stocks in an effort to generate higher returns and there were more recently a shift to higher cost, more complex investments. There are examples of states that have done very well in that regard. There's also a lot of ev evidence that uh, states have struggled to make hedge funds work from both a cost and performance perspective. Um, Vermont's rate of return is lower than its peer group in the way that we analyze this, but I think it's really important to point out that the state also has a lower risk profile with a much higher percentage of investments in bonds and a lower exposure to the stock market than most every other state in our study. I think that that's a, a well-reasoned strategy, provided that it fits in with the other pieces of how the state looks at public pensions. Um, and, and here again, I think this is the one place where we would go so far as to put the word recommend, um, that stress testing and analyzing carefully how pension finances may play out, given uncertainty in the financial markets, I think is essential for every state. This picture shows the long-term trend I mentioned a, a moment ago, going back, all the way back to 1954 where over time states have progressed towards portfolios that now have a total of 75% of assets in stocks and alternatives. Right now it's about 50% in uh, public equities or stocks, 25% in alternative investments including real estate, private equity, and hedge funds, and the balance in bonds. Um, some of you may be familiar with the storyline here where uh, there were really two factors. One was the advent of modern portfolio theory as applied to public sector investing. Um, gave people more information to think about the value of investing in stocks for the long term. And in most states, there were reduced restrictions on permissible investments. Um, going back to the 50s, most state laws prevented public pension funds from putting money in anything other than um, very safe corporate bonds and government bonds. This next slide provides, uh, tr takes that information and tries to put this in the context of what this means in terms of states risk exposure. Um, what the orange line on the top shows is the average assumed rate of return and how that's changed over time going back to 1992 for public pension funds. Back in 92, the average rate was a little bit above 8%. Today, it's about 7.4%. Um, so all, all things considered, that line has been relatively stable, particularly in comparison to the yield on the 30-year Treasury bond, which is the jaggedy blue line at the bottom. The Treasury bond is relevant because this is seen as the benchmark for risk-free investing. 
And as a result, what financial experts look at is the difference between the target rate you're trying to achieve for your investment portfolio and what could be achieved if you just invested in corporate bonds. So that gap, which we call the equity risk premium, has been as large as it's ever been. And so if we, when we talked about the fiscal position, looking at funded ratios and cash flow ratios about where states are today, this to me is the first bit of information that helps us to start looking forward and just be attentive to the fact that financial market volatility, given where states are invested, is an important consideration. And we see that volatility demonstrated in this next chart. Uh, what this does is compare the year-over-year -year rate of return for public sector pension systems on average. That's the purple line. Uh, it, Tux is, is the reference point for that, as compared to the S&P 500, the stock market, essentially. I think this is really interesting because it shows something we might expect, which is public funds track the stock market. The stock market is going to go up and down. It is going to uh, be very responsive to economic downturns or periods of high growth. Um, and, and so managing this volatility in the investments and what that can mean for state budgets, it, I think, is of utmost importance. This next chart compares the asset allocation of the U.S. averages that I mentioned a moment ago. About half are invested in stocks, with the other two quarters split between bonds and alternative investments to where Vermont is today. Um, I would really draw out two issues from this perspective. Um, what we see in the, the, the uh, green slice of the pie on the right-hand side uh, based on our calculations is that the state has about one-third in bonds. That's noticeably higher than what other states do, and a much lower exposure at 36% to the stock market. The classification of alternative investments, which here we have at 31%, is something that varies from state to state to state. We try to do this in a consistent way and also um, ask states to verify the data. What it includes is real estate, private equity, and hedge funds. And I think in the case of Vermont, it's important for me to point out that also includes investment strategies that could be reasonably be reallocated to the stock and bond categories. So the point I'm trying to make is that each state reports this information a little bit differently. And all things considered, Vermont has moved towards a lower risk investment portfolio, which should have lower levels of volatility than, um, than we saw in the last slide. As part of that shift to a, a lower risk portfolio, we have seen that the state has performed lower uh, than the other states that we look at in our 50 state study of pension fund investing. Uh, this group of states follows a group that all report uh, on a fiscal year basis, that's June 30th, um, with results that are gross of fees. That means that's before the performance figures don't deduct the cost of the investment managers. I wanted to touch upon this information and identify it as important, not so much from the perspective of pure performance. As I said before, a lot of this is a reflection of the state's uh, lower risk and lower exposure to the stock market, which by and large has done well coming out of the Great Recession. Um, but more as something to think about when the state considers its assumed rate of return on pension investments and its overall fiscal strategy. With all these big ideas in mind, I think one of the, the emerging trends that we've seen is uh, something called stress test reporting, um, which is a requirement that states are beginning to adopt, that in addition to the actuarial valuations and the financial information that each state is required to present in uh, under um, the Government Accounting Standard Board requirements for financial reports, uh, that there is additional work done to analyze pension costs and liabilities under different investment return scenarios um, in order to help policymakers think ahead from our uncertainty or consider what the impact of different reform options might be. Um, this is part of a general strategy where states are increasing contributions to uh, account for higher levels of investment risk um, in certain cases, modifying investment return targets and or asset allocation. This is something that we've seen in, in Vermont on the asset allocation side, doing, uh, moving towards something that's lower in risk. And we've seen a rapid reduction in the assumed rate of returns across multiple states or implementing changes to, to, to plan design, which we'll talk about shortly. But the bottom line for us is that we think that stress testing investment returns so people can understand not only the actuarial expected results for the pension systems, but what it might mean for beneficiaries and taxpayers and the state budget if investments underperform or if there's another economic downturn is absolutely essential. Uh, the Society of Actuaries Blue Ribbon Panel offered up a recommendation back in 2014 that I think gave everybody a really helpful foundation to think about this issue. We note here that California and Washington State have been doing this kind of work for a number of years. Uh, Hawaii and Virginia have adopted formal policies. We help write both of those working with them. And I mentioned before that Colorado 
uh, is now doing stress test reporting on a regular basis as well, and has done the best job, I think, of identifying this issue of insolvency risk. This next slide is, is something of a preview to work that we're going to be doing going forward. And what it shows is the stress test simulation model that Pew has created uh, to help cities and states uh, better understand what the financial projections may look like under these different uh, scenarios. So I thought I would just spend a minute on this, giving people a sense of kind of how this work gets done. On the left-hand side of the page, the inputs into the model include the actuarial projections. Uh, the capital market and asset allocation assumptions, that's forecasting out what we think investment returns might be under different conditions, and also state revenue forecasts, where the consideration of economic growth state by state by state is really important because that shows differences in, in states' abilities to pay. On the actuarial projection piece, I, I, I wanted to note that our efforts in this regard are to as, replicate as closely as humanly possible the projections that each state actuary uses. Um, you know, we have found that Every state's actuary understands their pension system better than anybody else possibly could. That coming up with a set of numbers that's consistent is helpful from a communications perspective. Um, getting into debates about which, whether this or that or the other assumption is correct is not productive and wastes important time. Um, and so we do our best job to mimic those numbers as closely as possible. And on the capital market and asset allocation side, we have a very sophisticated point of view where we've looked at the bottom up of national GDP growth um, and what we forecast for each of the different asset classes. And what that allows us to do is to analyze investment returns in a consistent fashion across the different states. And the state revenue forecasts, I think, is, is really spot on with some of the things that were discussed this morning. We actually look at the projections for uh, gross state product as a very high correlated proxy for how state budgets are expected to grow over time. Um, and then on the right-hand side of the page, it just talks a little bit about some of the outputs we see from this. So we think this is a powerful tool, an important approach. Um, as I mentioned before, there are now five states, actually, that have adopted this approach to analyzing their pension system. And two other states, Connecticut and New Jersey, have legislation that, that, that they're currently considering. Um, and, and we will also have a paper that's coming out next week where we do a detailed stress test examination of 10 states. Um, and I think the results are really fascinating. One of the topics we talked about before and something for Vermont to think about is uh, the interplay between the, the changes in the investment portfolio and the assumed rate of return on investments. Here again, I don't want anything to be, uh, come across as us saying what Vermont should do or being critical. Uh, it's just to point out that there has been a movement, as you see on the left-hand side of the page, towards rates of return that are much closer to 7%. I think we talked about California is going in that direction today. Connecticut went down to 6.9%. Uh, Virginia is at 7% already. And so I think there is a, sort of a downward shift. And, and Vermont, you can see. Um, yeah. It's more on the right-hand side of the page. I, one of the challenges that we see when states reconsider their investment return assumptions is that it can, it can lead too quickly to a sky is falling kind of conversation because people take that assumption and they plug it into the current actuarial funding policy and it, and it uh, produces numbers that are drastically increased in terms of required contributions. Um, our point of view is very different on this. You know, we think that the assumed rate of return should reflect the expected economics. Uh, our view is that stress test modeling is a way to better think about which contribution policies work better than others over time, and also that affordability is an important question. Um, so I think we would definitely point this out as something the state should consider, but we would say that as part of a more holistic review of the state's finances on pensions. And this next slide just gives a little bit of information on that emerging trend around stress test reporting to show the states that have adopted this. In this map, we also include um, states that have adopted investment fee transparency measures. Uh, we, we put a report out last year that looked really carefully at the uh, differences in how each state reports their pension fund investments. We offered up several recommendations, uh, one of which was complete fee disclosure on private equity investing. Um, most states today do not disclose the carried interest or performance fees on private equity investments. In aggregate, we estimate that's about a $4 billion in um, unreported fees. And I think we said this in our report, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, so I think this also fits in with how Vermont thinks about things. On the benefits design perspective, we just start off um, uh, looking at what Vermont does today. There's a lot of information on this page. This is something we would typically come back to if there were questions. Um, but what it does is it breaks down the different components of the uh, 
state's uh, defined benefit plan that it offers state workers, teachers, and municipal workers, and provide some information to put that into a 50-state context. I'm just gonna talk about one of the items on this list, which is the benefit multiplier. Um, and for those who may not be as familiar, the benefit multiplier refers to the percentage of benefit for each year of service that a public employee is entitled to uh, as a participant in a pension system. The median benefit multiplier across the country is 2%. And what that means is if a teacher works 35 years, they get 70% of their final average salary in the form of a pension benefit. That's the core of the, of the pension benefit calculation. Uh, in this regard, I think what we see is that uh, Vermont's benefit multiplier is somewhat lower than average, so the benefit is not one of those that are um, more expensive than other states, and it's also one of the states uh, among the vast majority of states that provide Social Security to public workers. So here again, there's a lot of information on this page. I'd be happy to come back to it if it's helpful. If we step back and think about the issues around benefits designed from a 50-state perspective, the first point is that 49 states implemented some kind of benefit reforms between 2000 and 2000, 2009 and 2015. Vermont is included in that. Every state, with the exception of Idaho, um, did something uh, to be responsive to the unfunded liabilities that grew coming out of the Great Recession. In most cases, that had to do with adjustments to existing defined benefit models. And in particular, what we saw are reduced cost of living or COLA adjustment benefits and some increase in what employees were expected to pay going forward. At the same time, nine states also passed reforms that made significant changes to the structure of the benefits. Um, the most common model is something that's called uh, a hybrid plan. It includes a smaller defined benefit pension with a defined contribution 401k style component that provides workers with an individual retirement savings account. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So we mentioned before that there are 16 states that have some version of alternative plan. For this purpose, we define an alternative plan as something other than a traditional defined benefit pension. Um, that includes defined contribution plans, 401k style plans in certain cases. Uh, the state plan for Michigan and all of the all, all workers in Alaska receive uh, benefits in the form of a 401k style plan today. Um, the hybrid plan shown in purple is the most common. Again, this is a defined contribution, I'm sorry, a defined benefit pension that's typically about half of what states were offering before combined with a uh, defined contribution 401k style model. Um, Washington states is one of the states that's called out here with that, that hybrid plan model. Uh, they were the first state to implement this back in the 1990s. And the Washington state model, as well as what most, most other states do, uh, follows what the federal government did in the 80s. This is a very proven model approach and something that we've been working with a number of states on. With that big idea in mind, the emerging trend we see here on, on the benefit side uh, is a, a move towards what we call a risk-managed hybrid plan. So the first point, as we talked about a moment ago, is that the DBDC hybrid plan uh, is, is really the most common alternative approach that states have looked at. And the second bullet point, we also know that within defined benefit plans, states have also been adopting what we refer to as cost-sharing measures. In its most basic form, what this requires is that employee contributions adjust automatically if investment returns are higher or lower than expected. Um, we think that's an improvement where policy has been in the past where the adjustments or the changes to different benefit parameters happen uh, under duress and in a state of crisis and in a reactionary way after the Great Recession uh, began, for example. Um, what the cost-sharing features in the defined benefit plans do is think proactively. And so if investment returns turn out to be lower than we thought, there's a formula built into place where employees have to contribute more to the pension system. And likewise, if investment returns play out to be better than expected, their contribution levels will go down. What the risk managed hybrid plan does is take this basic DBDC hybrid model and also incorporate these cost-sharing features on the defined benefit side. This isn't to say this is the right solution for, to, for Vermont. But again, I think this is the trend we're seeing in how states have um, really synthesized some of the most innovative ideas on benefit plan design. Our point is that the, the risk managed hybrid or the RMH preserves strong benefits that could be full replacement income for career workers, uh, an improved level of savings for non-career workers, and about 75% of public workers typically don't stay on to take a pension, um, while protecting tax, taxpayers against 50 to 75% of investment risk going forward. Um, we understand, and I, I think this is true in Vermont, that there's a strong commitment to 
preserving the pension promises that have been made to public workers. And I don't think there's any discussion about doing something different from that. Um, I think that we also see, based on what some of the other states have done, is that there are options that will maintain a defined benefit pension as part of an attractive compensation package. We'll get most workers to the, pretty much the same place in terms of replacement income, but are designed in a way that's a little bit more flexible, both for a mobile workforce and to protect taxpayers going forward. And we note here that as of 2017, there are four states that have um, uh, ad ad adopted models similar to this in whole or in part. So my concluding remarks um, on, on this, the most boring topic in the world, are, uh, as we've talked about before, we think the measures of fis fiscal health um, leave states as vulnerable as they've ever been to an economic downturn. Um, we would be happy to debate that point for as long and as much as anybody wants to because we are not coming this from the perspective of saying that uh, pension systems should be done away with. Um, in fact, there are places like North Carolina and Wisconsin that provide terrific benchmarks of well-funded pension systems that work. Um, but I, don't, I can't find a set of numbers that tells me anything different than the exposure is as great as it's ever been. The good news for Vermont is that the state is somewhere between average and in certain respects above average in terms of their f fiscal position and metrics. And so this is not a case like we would see in New Jersey or Colorado where insolvency is a real part of the conversation, um, but rather whether there's an opportunity for the state to preserve its good retirement system and make it better going forward. Um, and as we said before, there's no one size fits all to these solutions. Each state has their own priorities and goals for their public workforce and how they manage their state budget. Uh, we talked about key principles that we, that we apply in each case. Um, and also some of these emerging trends really can give state policymakers a head start about the issues that are most important to think about. Um, that concludes our remarks today. Uh, I hope we have some time for questions and I thank you for bearing with me on this important topic. Yes, when Hold on, Shara's coming. So uh, folks on the table also are three by five cards. If you don't want to stand up and ask your question, but you'd like to write it down, we can then feed it to Greg. So um, Greg, I'll follow you up on your invitation to ask you what are your recommendations for Vermont? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Um, I, I, if, if, if we were to lay this out, we would say that the first step would be to uh, establish some reasonably clear goals about what, what the state wants to achieve from both a fiscal sustainability and retirement perspective. Um, all of us have been in strategic goal planning exercises and we know those things are only a, as good as the effort that's put into them. But I think you can provide a pretty reasonable, uh, you can get pretty quickly to some solid goals to say, for example, uh, we want a path to fully fund our pension promises. We want to uh, follow a contribution pro policy that protects us against downside risk defined as a 5% long-term investment return scenario. And so you can put hard numbers against what that policy is supposed to achieve. Um, that we want a, a, a pension plan that provides, for example, full replacement income for a career worker and a savings rate of 10% for a non-career worker. Um, I'm giving specific examples really to try to demonstrate that um, I think there's an opportunity that you could set pretty clear goals that uh, would require some discussion um, but something I think, you know, perhaps policymakers could agree on or could agree on a range of goals. Uh, the second thing is I think that the state ought to consider adopting a stress test reporting framework. Um, the two biggest pushbacks we get on that one are it can confuse matters with the important actuarial uh, numbers that are produced by each system and that it can be expensive. On the confusion front, I think I made a point of emphasizing that the right way to do this is to use the actuarial projection as a baseline. Um, and then the second point I would say is that in addition, there being nonprofit organizations that can help. Uh, in the state of Hawaii, the cost estimate they received for what they wanted to do was $12,000. This is something that, that, that can and should be done. Uh, the third thing I think is that the state should um, evaluate the assumed rate of return on investments given the recent change, or not, given the current status of the investment portfolio. Um, and with the benefit of stress test analysis, take a careful, thoughtful approach to um, calibrating the contribution policy to make those pieces fit together. That seems to me to be a pretty tactical and straightforward issue to consider. Um, and I will say it again, that we don't present that as um, 
uh, as sort of a, 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 secret, a thinly veiled way to show that the sky is falling. We just think you can tighten up assumptions and strengthen your policy and that will lead to better outcomes and we can demonstrate that. Um, the, the fourth thing I would say is that uh, a, a quick and thorough review of what other states are doing on some of the trends that I mentioned, particularly around benefit plan design options, is something that's uh, both worthwhile and pretty accessible. Um, you, know, you could, for example, look at Vermont's pension benefits today and compare what they might look like for different public workers, a career worker and a younger worker who may change job, um, based on some of the different models that, be, that are being looked at. And, and that one we would encourage this comparative analysis because it doesn't make an effort to start with the answer in mind. It's really sort of a, a, a standard framework, and we have this published on our website, about thinking through the retirement security issues. Um, and, and the fifth one, and this one is a little bit more open-ended, and I'd love to be educated on that, would be to review the state's retiree health care benefits in the context of what the state is doing as part of national health care reform more generally. I don't have a specific idea around that, but I think the ob observation we have is that historically states have made these very large commitments to retiree health care. Uh, national health care reform uh, happened and, and is still under discussion, as we all know, perhaps frustrating for many of us. Um, because we think it's good policy. I don't know of a state that would be better situated to think about those two issues at the same time and really just to, to explore, for example, whether there's a path to providing the exact same retiree health care benefit or a similar benefit, but take into account what the national health care reform offers and whether the federal government subsidies could be part of that equation. Um, so those just, you know, for what it's worth, are the five ideas that we came up with. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, uh, Greg, the um, equity premium, which was the gap between um, returns on equity and um, where portfolios are actually, what portfolios are actually earning. Yep. Um, to the extent that there's a gap between the return assumptions and the real assumptions, and I'm not directing this necessarily at Vermont, but first part of my question is, are anyone's pants on fire to the extent that there, there is this gap between what the states assume to be earning and what people who watch the markets know can be earned. And as a follow-up to that, coincidentally, there was just an article in the journal you may have seen about the case de depot, which has earned a, a return of about 10.5% per year over the last five years, but they actively manage investments. I think they're going to be managing a new light rail system uh, near Montreal. Uh, the other Canadian pensions have taken equity positions in privatized airlines uh, or airports, excuse me. Are there states that are looking at ways to bolster the return by actively managing infrastructure projects? And uh, I, I couldn't hear, th those are really good questions. I couldn't hear the one part of it. Could you, could you just help me understand the pants on fire? Um, there, is a, is there, a, there is a gap between the uh, announced assumption and the actual returns on many state portfolios. Right. Is that just a forecasting error, or is that disingenuous on the part of some, some pay, state yeah. pension managers? I, that, 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 that's an important and complex question, and I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion and what, what I think some of the facts show. Um, first off, well, on average right now, states are, uh, have an assumed rate of return of 7.4% on their investment portfolios. Um, the best number that we can come up with based on our own ground up analysis, looking at economic forecasts going forward, and referencing what other uh, reputable organizations like uh, Wilshire Consulting, for example, they, they uh, know more than anybody about public pension funds, is probably something closer to 6.4%. Um, and I should really emphasize, actually, that's what the experts are showing. And the bottom up analysis we did as non investment experts, but knowledgeable people, comes up with about that same number. Um, Nobody has a crystal ball and knows for perfect, but that one percentage point gap is probably a good indication of what investment experts think plans are overshooting from, overshooting about. Um, what's also interesting is if you dig into it, almost that full difference can be accounted for in differences between inflation assumptions that economists and investment experts use, which typically rely on the CBO long-term factor of 2%, and what the plans are using in their actuarial reports. Um, so there's about a percentage point difference in terms of what's putting them out there, but a lot of it can be explained as something as really being non-economic. Um, the next thing I would say, though, is that all the actuarial projections and the assumed rate of return take a very long-term perspective, which is appropriate. And so I think it's understandable that 
those two things in terms of what the actual rate may be going forward and what people are pricing it at may take some time to, to kind of come together. Um, so I, I think the short answer is I don't know that anyone's uh, uh, pants are on fire right now because of those differences. I would also say what the equity risk premium shows us is not something that's wrong. It's not a value statement. It's just saying the level of exposure that we have to the up and the down swings of the stock market. Um, so in that regard, I think I, we would go to our good friend stress testing as a way to do the analysis, to show what the results might be at a lower rate of return in a manner that doesn't require a lengthy and protracted uh, debate about actuarial assumptions, because I don't know that that's productive. Um, I don't know the particulars of the article you mentioned in the second point, which I think had to do with whether states are looking at active management, uh, and maybe in particular around private equity and, and some of the um, uh, international approaches. I would say that uh, um, international funds typically have done much more of their private equity and alternative investing in-house. Part of the reason they've been able to do that is they have a much more flexible compensation structure. In the states, uh, the people who work for the public pension funds are something of a, are, fall somewhere in between from a compensation perspective, what a typical public worker would get and what somebody at Wall Street would get. So in other words, states aren't typically equipped to pay the high salaries that would be required to bring some of those sophisticated uh, investment ideas in-house. Um, so I, I, I would say that there has been some discussion that the uh, Texas Teacher Retirement Fund, for example, has a very uh, thoughtful and sophisticated model working closely with um, private equity partners that the state of Massachusetts has one of the best alternative programs in the country um, and has been bring, bringing some real estate in-house. But for the most part, we would probably say that it, it would be uh, difficult to assume that the states are equipped from a compensation perspective and an expertise perspective to do more in-house as opposed to less. Uh, we heard earlier that uh, there were three main risks to pension funds, and looking at the and looking at uh, the chart with New York at 98 percent, um, it looks like that the political funding risk was at least as big as the investment risk. Uh, and uh, what's your perspective on that? Um, I I think that's a pretty fair statement. I, I think that we. Um, Looking historically, uh, whether states have set aside enough money based on the assumptions or following their own policies, I, I think is the driver to understand the best. And so, yes, without exception. Um, and then looking forward, I think uh, the investment risk is a big part of the equation. When we do the stress test simulation model, uh, we look at a set of simulations based on different economic scenarios and something we call the um, policymaker behavior framework. So in the investment scenarios, it just says, what if returns are 5%? What if we see a market crash according to the Dodd-Frank specifications? Um, the policymaker behavior part is, is much more nuanced and, and a, lot, a lot more interesting, actually. Um, and what we essentially say is we'll make two assumptions. One is they follow their, the, the law to the T, whatever their policy is in place. And the other one says that they will, uh, states will increase contributions, but um, they will not increase pension costs as a share of the budget. So basically, you have an upper lower bound of likely behavior. Um, and then you can kind of peel back the onion on that. We have a really cool measure we call tolerance for payment. It was originally called tolerance for pain, but we didn't want it to come off as negative. So um, what the tolerance for payment looks at, to get to your point, is historically how much have been states been willing to increase their pension contributions when there's been unfunded liabilities. Um, I wish I had this slide for this because I think it's really interesting. But what you end up seeing, to answer your question, is a range of potential behavior. Um, one that shows contributions growing significantly following the letter of the law of the state policy. Uh, another one that's lower, which says, well, we're going to keep paying the same amount as 4% of the budget every single year with economic growth. And then there's a line in between that puts this tolerance for payment constraint on things. Um, uh, I guess the short answer to your question is yes. Greg, I, I have a question regarding when you when you look at all the states that you know you've worked with and that you research. Is there a a couple of models you've seen where people with a sense of comedy and 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 goodwill uh, are able to look at this coming from different sides of the table and and be successful? I don't know if it's commissions or 
but, but, but what are some really successful policies of getting to uh, differing results that maybe are better long term? Right. Um, that's a great question. I'm going to buy, buy myself some time by also pointing out a couple states that have just done well no matter what on managing their public, system, public sector systems. Uh, the state of Wisconsin stands out. They have a traditional defined benefit model, um, but have a very strong policy on making contributions that they stick to and also have built in some of these cost sharing features. Um, when we did this 10 state stress test analysis, we found that Wisconsin uh, didn't trip any uh, fiscal metric under any scenario we looked at because they'd really accounted for everything. Um, and so I just wanted to conflate my answer to your question a little bit to pause on that one. Um, probably North Carolina and, and Tennessee are two other states that have uh, sort of been most successful in implementing good reforms. I would say that there really is no single exact effective way to have this dialogue. It really is kind of a no one size fits all approach. Uh, Tennessee, I think, has one of the best designed, most innovative models, and it was a case where the state treasurer working in some general coordination with legislators just made it happen. They got really good advice. Um, they thought about the issue really carefully. They did the right analysis and kind of just made it so in a relatively short legislative time frame. Um, one of the states we're working in today in South Carolina just happens to follow a form where uh, Republicans and Democrats from different side of the aisle know they disagree on things, but when it comes time to do something important, they have a standard rhythm where they put a commission together that actually does real work. Um, I don't know Vermont as well, but I think you also know that sometimes commissions are where policy ideas go to die. Um, so I, I, I really think it really depends from state to state and place to place, and that there's a way to uh, be as transparent as you can be as soon as possible. Greg, could you come back to the longevity risk for a moment? With the investment risk, it's pretty easy to measure the, the difference between the assumption and the actual return, yep. and that's creating the unfunded liability. But how are we measuring the longevity risk? If pension funds are still assuming a life expectancy of X, and we know today that that life expectancy is much bigger, yep. is that not being reflected and therefore the unfunded liability is actually not a lot larger? I, I, that's a great question. Uh, before I answer that, are there any actuaries in the room? Just to make sure. Okay, I feel more comfortable then. Um, so, I, 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 if you were to say there's the two biggest concerns you have on the numbers, you would probably speak to investment risk and the mortality piece. Uh, and then I think policymaker behavior is, is sort of the overlay level of concern. We focus our analysis on investment piece for exactly the reason you said, which is something you can do. Um, with a reasonable degree of uh, comfort that you're kind of capturing the right issues, um, with an understanding that longevity is also a big question mark. So to be totally open with you, I think we made a decision in our stress test simulations to focus on one issue because we thought it's something that you could put numbers around, and by itself it's really, really important and potentially problematic. Um, I think that the, my, the, the, the headlines on longevity risk are over time actuaries and therefore state reporting on pension liabilities continues to reflect uh, an extension of life expectancy. Um, and, and we see this in the numbers where periodically uh, the actuaries will pass a new standard of practice for this and the liability figures will bump up a little bit. The most recent version of that that I think states began implementing on average about five years ago incorporates an idea called generational mortality. And what this does is not only take the latest and greatest figures about life expectancy and use that for the forecast going forward, but essentially makes assumptions about how, what, is, what life expectancy is expected to do going forward. So they're, they're accounting for the fact that there uh, will be continued improvements in how long people are expected to live. Um, so I would point that out to say that by no means makes that a non-issue, but you know, from my best understanding is that the actual practices have gotten, the actuarial practices have gotten better and stronger over time. Um, I also understand that among the community there, there are you know, a couple different points of view on the issue. Um, one is that this idea of continuing uh, extensions in life expectancy is something people need to keep forecasting. Um, there's another idea that there, that there will be uh, some slowing down uh, of that assumption. So it's a really important topic, and I think we haven't focused on it uh, at a rigorous way in our analysis yet, only because we think this investment piece is right in front of us and needs the most attention. <laughs> 
I could. Uh, I'm Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and I'm going to do my own presentation, but I, so I'm not going to get into opinions. I'm just going to state a couple of facts. Um, so uh, we do um, have mortality built in with improvement scales into our system. We recently went to what's called the RP 2014 modified, which is a, a new uh, scale with generational, and you're going to see some uptick in, in, in our numbers based on that. Um, so we do build that in, we have built that in. Private sectors actually had a different situation. They did not have a change. Uh, it was a, they had RP 2000 and then 2014. Yep. So private sectors actually got hit with bigger problems in terms of mortality because they, um, uh, they hadn't updated those scales in a very long time. On the pension side and the investments, I'll talk more, and I would hope to get a question about that later, folks. Uh, but uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, when we come up with that rate of return, it's done by two different groups. NEPC, which is a pension, like, like Wilshire and some of the other groups, they do a, a model taking our asset allocation and a long-term capital assessment, do their own. They came up with 76 we also had our actuary, which is Siegel, do it, and they put it the, 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 it into their own assumption base and, and, and asset allocation, put it into a capital model. They came up with 7.5, and we took the lower one in a consensus model. We did not pick the number. Why the boards have to approve with the actuaries, and we've never turned around and said, yeah, we don't like that one, it should be higher. We don't do that. We've taken the models that professional, independent actuaries and, and CFAs have put together for us. Uh, so I just wanted to make a clarification on that. And one other clarification, what, uh, the numbers that you have, uh, we changed over to net reporting our investments two years ago. Okay. Um, so I think, you, I think I would agree with you that's a better way of going. I want to compliment our chair of the VPIC who's made a lot of changes over the last two years, um, uh, Tom Galanco over there. But we do now report the numbers as of net. Thank you. Great. Can I just comment on that for a second? Or can I respond? Yes. I, I, thank you, Madam Treasurer, for bringing that up. And I think, uh, so the point was made is that the state has adopted the most up-to-date uh, mortality assumptions. So that's a good thing. Um, you also mentioned the state has moved to what's called net of fees reporting that shows results after the deduction of investment fees. So that's another one of our transparency recommendations, which is a positive. Um, and, and I think I, I don't dispute the, um, uh, the, the, the credibility of the organization, I know both of the organizations very well as we talked about earlier, and NEPC is extremely <laughs> reputable as is Siegel in that regard. Um, pardon me? I think yes, um, so I think, that, but I think that all of those points are valid. And, and I just think on the investment return issues, it's a question of, um, another way to look at it would be, is there a lower rate of return to think about just so that we're better protected from the downside? And so that the, the state isn't targeting the 50th percentile with a flip of a coin going either way but something that may, uh, you might feel more comfortable is more certain to occur. I guess maybe that's a way to calibrate it. Um, I assume you've been into the weeds on the hybrid system. I noticed on your map only four systems seem to have adopted it. Do you have an information on how many systems have looked at it and rejected it? Is the, any of that rejection based on an immediate budgetary imposition of more costs due to having to run side-by-side -side expensive systems for the long term. And uh, this is sort of get away from the actuary things. With giving sure. Me yeah, okay, okay. So, so the question is whether the states that have implemented uh, hybrid plans have taken into account that they're adding a defined contribution co component well, which has cost to it. And I guess my specific is do they get away from increased budgetary cost by seriously altering benefits for members? over the long term. Um, or immediately. Yeah, I th well, I think in the immediate, I would say no. It, 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 in most cases, it's not going to have a substantial impact either way. That typically the results of those changes to benefit design um, end up with the state contributing uh, benefits for new, uh, new and current workers at about the same level they were before. The administrative costs are really important, but they are inco inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. The, the, the way what, what it isn't going to change the cost trajectory if the state is going to achieve a 7.5% rate of return. If, however, the rate of return is only 6% or 5% or something like that, and I think thinking about things in terms of the downside, when dollars for education and transportation are, are what are at risk, um, that's the analysis that demonstrates how taxpayers can be better protected. So in the case of 
Pennsylvania, I think, and in Pennsylvania, we found that over a 30-year time horizon, the state's fiscal position would be improved by $16 billion, about 10 percentage points on the funded ratio, um, if returns were only 5%. That's a stress test analysis that doesn't tell you what the answer is going to be, but gives you an indicator of just how much, um, what the different outcomes may be. The flip side is that does mean slightly lower benefits for workers on the defined contribution side, but we still found that they were getting to full replacement income. Um, I'm sorry, does that get closer to answering the question, or? Well, short term, too, and uh, other point was, how many have they examined it and rejected it? Examined it and rejected it. Um, so quickly going through the states that have done that. Connecticut did this most recently. Uh, Pennsylvania was the state that it did it before that. The traditional hybrid model has been in place for years in Washington State, Tennessee, Georgia, Indiana, and, one other, and at least one other jurisdiction. Um, states that have considered it and rejected it. Um, I, I, I don't know, I would have to think about that. Andrea, can you think off the top of your head about a location that gave strong consideration this idea and put it off? Um, I don't know. I, I would say that most every plan that made changes there to divine benefit plan probably had a conversation somewhere along the way about uh, what things might look like if they adopted a hybrid. So, you know, by that observation, uh, most states have decided that's not the path that they want to go down. But what we're seeing is, you know, now that we're eight years past the onset of the Great Recession, not in the thick of it, states have more time to think about these issues a little bit more carefully. And so um, there's a little bit of an uptick in, in some of those changes. Um, but I, I can't think of an example where somebody did a thorough analysis, had something on the table, um, considered it, and just decided it wasn't right for them. Um, at a very detailed level, but I think by the, the fact that most states have preserved their DB plans mostly as they are says that they've chosen not to adopt that route. Any questions? Nothing else. Okay. Great. Oh, it's like a question right there. Oh, excuse me. So I'm not an actuary, but um, uh, if, if a state is going to save $16 billion in the long run, uh, who, who's going to pay for that? It seems to me that cost is going to be picked up by the employees not getting benefits um, that they would under a DB plan. Uh, and I also doubt that an individual's investment strategy is going to be as productive as a state's investment investment strategy. Are my considerations off base? Uh, no, I think, your, I think your considerations are spot on. Um, you know, the, the, your considerations are spot on. So to give an example of analysis that we did in the state of Pennsylvania, what we did start with was measuring what retirement security for public workers would be under the new model. Um, and we measured that specifically as replacement income as a percentage of take-home pay. Those are terms of art that just say, is the amount of money you're going to have to spend going to be close to or the same as what you had in retirement after you take into account uh, that you're no longer paying certain taxes or contributing to Social Security and so forth. We found in the hybrid model uh, that became the default in Pennsylvania um, that most public workers would be pretty close to 100% replacement income after tax, um, even in a scenario where, for example, the uh, defined contribution component only generated 5% returns. Um, so I, I think that's a way of answering the question to acknowledge that a starting point should be what is the impact going to be on workers. Um, the second thing I would say, and I think you drew out, is whether it's a good idea, generally speaking, to have individuals make their own investment decisions in a defined contribution type model. Um, and uh, I, I think my sentiments are completely aligned with yours, which is most people aren't set up to do that. So if you go back to the, um, let me find this here. You go back to core principles. On the retirement security side, what we say is invest assets in professionally managed pool of investments with low fees and appropriate asset allocations. So in this case, in the, in the context of a four, the component of a hybrid plan uh, that would be in a 401k style piece, professionally managed can mean the use of target date funds, funds that investment experts put together with a mix of stocks and bonds that reflect uh, where each person is in their uh, career and what their risk profile is. Um, long story short, it's a way to take the investment decision making uh, 
out of individuals' hands and let them establish their goals and have the target date fund do the work. Uh, the federal government's thrift savings uh, plan, I think, has been doing this for years and years. Um, pooled investments means essentially the same thing, which is um, by having experts invest everybody's money in a limited number of funds, you're going to keep fees low, which gets to the low fee piece where we think there's two investments that, that belong in that, kind of, uh, in that kind of model. One are the target date funds that address this issue about uh, professional expertise, and the second are index funds. And again, the thrift savings plan is a perfect example. They have five target day funds and five low fee index funds. Um, the cost would be equal to or less than the cost of the pension system from that perspective. Um, the target date funds take the investment decision making and put it in the hands of experts. And for those who want to make some decisions on their own, the low fee index funds keep the cost low. Um, and so from that perspective, I think we would argue that that model with the appropriate asset allocation probably would have the same expected rate of return as the pension fund over time. Um, the point that you started with is if investment returns end up in being lower than expected, um, maybe closer to the 5% across the board instead of, instead of 7%, um, you're absolutely right that that means individuals' balances when they retire is going to be lower than it would have otherwise, and they will get less in retirement income than they would from a DB plan. Um, but I think that this, if you think about this as a balancing act, you have something that achieves full replacement income and also protects taxpayers against unplanned costs. Um, and so I think those are the kind of considerations that people should look at. But I think all your sentiments are spot on. Yeah, Greg, uh, with, with regard to stress testing yeah. and the legislation uh, or maybe its policies, that other states have, have implemented. What, 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 what specifically, can you give us a couple of concrete examples? Is, is, was it laws that were passed, the reports created, who creates the report, yeah. who gets the report? What, what exactly is going on with regard to stress testing in a few states? So I, I, th I think, and we can, I wish I had this legislation and I could we'd be delighted to share it with the treasurer and others, but two recent examples uh, are Virginia and Hawaii. What the legislation in Virginia requires is that the plan, right, in, in consultation with the actuary, produce a set of reports that forecasts out pension costs and liabilities <coughs> under uh, two or three predefined conditions. And in particular, it, it, uh, the requirements are um, results for the rate of return is two percentage points below the expected rate. In Virginia, that's 7% expected, a 5% downside, um, as well as an asset shock scenario that considers uh, a big drop in the stock market like we saw at the onset of the Great Recession. Um, and then it turns the duties and responsibilities and you know, lists out the factors that are to be produced and leaves it to the actuary and the plan to figure out. Um, so I would say that's an example where the plan is responsible for it, the role of the actuary is clear, that the guidelines of what those reports should show are also fairly specific, but it stops short of being prescriptive and sort of a, it, it's two paragraphs rather than two pages, if that makes sense. In the case of Hawaii, uh, the con it's consistent in that uh, the plan and the actuary have the same requirements to produce similar results. Um, the only difference is that it is much more detailed and prescriptive as to the assumptions that should be used in those downside scenarios. So for example, uh, in the quote unquote asset shock, that's a, a, a big drop in the, in the stock market, um, you might clearly define the Dodd-Frank adverse scenario as required by state law for banks to test as your benchmark for setting those assumptions. So I think in both cases, it's expected that um, the plan would do that. And I think it can be the actuary or it could be somebody else. Um, and then it just becomes a matter of uh, how each state feels about in, in terms of how prescriptive they want to be uh, in, in, in sort of giving direction. And just, I think uh, his other point, is there any specificity as to who um, that reporting is shared with, how broadly it's shared? Um, I, I think that, I'm, I'm trying to remember the specific, I think the expectation is that it would be uh, produced at the, at the plan level and shared in the same way that uh, standard financial reporting is shared. So I, I don't recall the exact specifics about the reporting requirements. I think there's a pretty clear expectation and maybe some specific language that this would be included with the annual reports that the actuary produces and the plan produces. And I don't know that there's been any pushback or concern about it being something that shouldn't be shared in that way. When you were talking about target date funds as being a 
relatively secure place for people when they have to invest on their own. Um, in the first conference I was at after the 2008 meltdown, uh, over dinner I happened to be at a table with uh, um, uh, an executive from a company that does both institutional and retail investing. And um, I pointed out that their 2010 target date fund was down close to 40%. And I said that didn't seem to be offering a great deal of protection. And he said, look, we're, we're much more heavily weighted in equities than that. If we actually gave downside protection for this kind of an adjustment, year in and year out, we would be so much below our competitors that we wouldn't exist now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not all that convinced that individual investors on their own can protect themselves in the way that you think they can. Oh, no, I think that's absolutely fair. I think the problem the target date fund, as an example, solves is that it prevents individuals from uh, making the typical mistakes that we see in 401k plans all the time, uh, putting, putting money into uh, funds with fees that are too high, you know, without any sort of commensurate um, benefit from that, and allocating assets in a way that really can't be explained. So not, not just not having the right mix of stocks and bonds. It can't protect you from uh, the up and down swings of the markets. I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but it, it also, maybe a simpler way to think about this would just be to uh, think about a 60-40 portfolio. You know, what if the plan was set up in such a way that defaulted individuals, just as an example, into something that's 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Um, Madam Treasurer, I think you all do co points of comparison on the pension fund against similar portfolios. So this is a, the 60-40 idea is, is something that people look at as a benchmark. Um, and then the state of Oklahoma state plan for public workers takes a similar approach. They actually feel like, well, target date funds are great, but maybe too complicated. We're just gonna put people on a 60-40 low fee up front and that's it. Um, so those are just examples of ways to solve the problems of poor, poor decision making on individuals, by individuals, and, and high fees that really don't pay for themselves. Um, but none of those things can protect somebody from, from market risk or, or, the up, or the upside in the market as well. That, that's a fair statement. You mentioned, I think in your last or second to last slide, uh, unanticipated costs to taxpayers. I think it was the phrase you used is not putting in what the actuaries require, the ARC, uh, an unanticipated cost? Uh, yes, not, not paying the actuary required amount will, um, yeah, from, from our perspective, would generate un unanticipated costs over time, right? The, the, the cost of the pension system is dependent upon the accuracy of the assumptions and policymaker behavior following through on their part of the job to, to keep the system uh, affordable and sustainable. And if there's falling short on that, as we all know, that ends up costing more over time because of the lost investment earnings that those funds would otherwise have generated. So yes, that, I think that would be a fair characterization. We'd agree with that. Um, quick, quick question, and I, 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 I guess I don't know how to think about this, and I wonder how you think about this. Um, we, we think, or we tend to think very binarily, uh, retiree, uh, taxpayer, um, how, when it plays out when there's not enough retirement assets, what's the data on how much comes back to taxpayers ultimately? Is there any data? In other words, through, with insufficient, uh, within, I guess you call it insufficient safety net or with insufficient retirement assets, um, how much ultimately then goes back to the taxpayer versus right. Uh, say charitable organizations, family. I, you know, I don't know if there's any data, but I never yep. know how to quantify this, or if indeed this fits into uh, a useful way to think about it. Right. I, I think the question you're asking, and please tell me if I'm wrong, is if we were to do something, if Vermont was to do something different than it's doing today in the in the benefits it provides to public workers. Um, and those benefits were not as good as they've been historically. Is there some unforeseen cost to the state? Uh, if those people end up, you know, it be being in a poverty kind of situation, I th if that's the right question that you're asking. And I think it's a totally fair question. I would say that that concern is something that the seven states that don't provide Social Security for their public workers should be absolutely concerned about. In the state of Colorado, for example, as we've talked about before, um, they have done a really good job of assessing fiscal health. The state has a an unusual provision that 
constrains their ability to increase budget spend, budgetary spending across the board. Um, and it's also true that the public workers do not participate in Social Security. So you have a system that's really at risk, and then you have uh, hundreds of thousands of public workers who depend on retirement income completely from that pension system and are not participating in Social Security. Um, I can't uh, quantify for you sort of exactly what that could mean, but I think that's the place where it's applicable. Um, the good news is it's very limited. It's, it's seven, it's 25% of public workers overall, a lot of, I'm sorry, 25% of teachers. It is 40% of public workers all, a lot of the, the municipal police and fire, another example. So I think that would be the area to sort of give that issue some attention. But in Vermont, the participation in social security prevents that. And, and I would say if you start with that foundation and, and we would estimate that for the typical public worker, social security uh, taking account for inflation would provide 35 to 40% replacement income. Um, I think you get to a safe place under a number of different approaches pretty quickly from there. Um, in other words, if the replacement income after tax for a public worker is 70 or 80 percent versus 100 percent, I'm not saying any of those numbers are correct. I think all of those outcomes are in a range where I would be hard pressed to understand why um, that's forecasting unplanned costs in terms of people going into poverty. So the short answer is for states that don't or plans where Social Security is not part of it, I think that's a consideration. And in other instances, I, I don't think there's really data to prove that that's uh, part of the equation looking forward. In your discussion of OPEB, you s suggested that we take a look at the relationship between the plans, health care benefits, and the federal government. Could you expand on that? Yeah. I'll, I'll expand on that if, if I can also just be really careful. Um, so uh, currently, the state provides a pretty significant benefit for public workers in the, in the form of retiree health care. Um, if we think about the developments at the national level in providing affordable health care for all, um, and if we think about Vermont as being one of the states I th that probably has one of the most sophisticated perspectives on that in the country, uh, Massachusetts, my home state, is obviously another one because of, of where we started 10 years ago. Um, it stands to reason that a conversation about both those things at the same time could make sense. Um, what I don't want to suggest is that we have any really specific recommendation because we've talked to other states and it's proven to be a really difficult conversation. Um, but it could be the case that there are lower income workers who would do just as well under the national program. Um, and if that's a way to uh, have lower costs for the state through the benefit of federal subsidies, maybe that's something to think about. Um, I realize I'm the one that brought this up, but I want to be really cautious about this because this is the perfect example of, you know, Vermont needs to come up with its own solutions. Um, but what I will say in a number of states, we've had this conversation come up. The focus of it ha has been whether lower income workers could do just as well under the federal program at a lower cost to the state. And then it inevitably becomes so complicated, it's hard to move it forward. So um, I, I was hoping the people of Vermont could, could kind of educate us about whether that's something to, to, to analyze. So. So what time frame does Pew recommend or are you seeing nationwide as far as repairing the funded status of pensions, given the fact that the government will allow uh, a 30-year plan to, to be enacted by state municipal governments and some governments choose to redo their plan every one, two, three, four, five years and get a fresh 30 years. We aren't doing that, but I would like to know what is the, the you know, nationally and what is your recommendation as far as length of time to repair the pensions, right. please? Okay, so I, I think that question is asking what is the right um, time horizon or target date for the state and the actuaries to calculate these payments towards the unfunded liability around. Um, and just by way of background, you referenced a really important point, which is that the accounting standards in the states allow for uh, a 30-year time horizon with some level of flexibility. Um, and I think what has happened over time in many places is that people have taken that 30-year uh, time horizon for paying down the unfunded liability, which is uh, an accounting um, boundary from under GASB, and use that to inform policy. And lo and behold, the math says if you come up with a 30-year mortgage payment plan, you actually lose ground, you don't make it up. Um, so the short answer, I think, is that uh, most of the experts are now pointing towards a 20-year time horizon as one that is sufficient to expect to make progress year over year on getting to fully funded status and provides a little bit of cushion in the face of a downturn. Um, there's a, and, and I think Vermont is pretty much there. 
I don't, I don't know if you would tell me differently. And so I think that that's good news. There are some uh, nuanced technical terms. Uh, layered amortization says if you have a loss, it's okay to uh, come up with a plan to pay for that loss over its own 20-year time horizon, but just don't go beyond it. Um, and, and I think what's interesting is that the Moody's Treading Water Benchmark, the net amortization metric that we publish every year around, uh, a recent report from one of the actuarial bodies that looked at this idea of what's the right answer to make progress on paying down your unfunded liability, kind of come back to the 20 year number or something less than that as being the right answer. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's sort of the way the thinking in, in the field has emerged. Greg, can I just pick up on your middle point about investing in professionally managed pooled investments? You mentioned Social Security and it has its place, but, but many people have said Social Security is a massive hit on younger people. I mean, there are workers and there are workers. And if you look at Social Security's returns relative to someone who started off young and was putting it in a professionally managed pooled investment, there could be quite a gap. So isn't there also a generational impact in terms of defined benefit plans that are over-invested in fixed income? And are any states examining the differential risk aversion, risk preference of workers and recognizing that younger workers might have a different perspective on retirement contributions than older workers? Um, well, in, in the case, I mean, the case of Social Security, the way the money in effect is invested is at a risk-free rate. Um, and I think it's generally understood that the younger you are, the more you're paying for uh, whatever benefit you're getting from Social Security. Um, I, we would not be part of starting a conversation to do away with Social Security, so we take that as an important given uh, and a foundation for, for retirement savings, if in, as imperfect as it may be. Um, I, the question you're asking is a really interesting one, if I'm understanding it correctly, and also a, a pretty sophisticated one, which is whether I think if I have this right, um, have states examined whether the investment strategies they're following for their pension funds are uh, aligned with the younger workers that are now entering the workforce and how they would choose to invest that money? Correct. I mean, it's difficult. It's an abstraction in Vermont. We have about six young people. Um, but if you go to other states, I mean, that's perhaps why you felt so youthful as soon as you drove into the state. States that really have young people, yeah. I work with young people, and someone who's in their early 20s and you discuss retirement, their perspectives on what they're going to invest and what they expect are radically different from someone closer to retirement. This room or even this state is perhaps yeah. not a good representation of, of that. Uh, I, I, the, the short answer is no. I don't think anybody has. It's a really good and sophisticated question. I don't think anybody's been able to uh, crack that nut. I, I think that while uh, we're coming to understand that millennials are more sophisticated uh, in a number of different ways, including in certain respects understanding um, you know, why index funds and ETFs are better than trying to gamble on the stock market making their own decisions. I, I, we, all the research we show uh, demonstrates that people in their 20s understand retirement's important, but really aren't thinking about it as much as they do progressively in their 30s and 40s. Um, I don't think the internet has not changed human behavior in terms of how we look forward on these kind of issues. Um, so market timing takes on all kinds of uh, faces. Uh, in the governor's presentation this morning, he mentioned uh, essentially that we have population problems. Have you done any correlation with um, flight from states like Vermont that taxes uh, benefits and has relatively low benefit structure and uh, individuals leaving to head for other places? I think in one of our plans, fully 25% of our benefits go to other zip codes, and that probably is not a great thing for oh. our economy. Um, that's a good question. I think, no, I think that looking at whether... Oh, I can, I can. Um, do they do any tracking on where people go when they don't have adequate income and whether um, there's flight characteristics based upon people leaving for lower tax situations or things like that and how that impacts local economies since a dollar spent outside the state is no benefit to the state at all. Right. No, I, I think on, I, that, that sort of thing is just outside the scope of our project. Um, I, think, I think one of 
th this is somewhat related, but one of the issues that we have been, there's been more attention to is whether uh, the budget challenges um, that depend a lot on pensions in states like New Jersey um, are starting to have some of these migration impacts that previously have been, have been kind of a point of contention among economists. Um, but I, I understand that's a slightly different question than you were asking. All right, unless there's one last burning question, uh, let us thank Greg for his presentation and questions, and then we'll take a break before we go into our panels. Thank you.